Yeah, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and that's the one o'clock block on a given Wednesday. We're here with Max Samarov. He joins us from the East Coast. He's with Stand With Us, which is a, an anti-bigotry organization, Jewish anti-bigotry organization. Um, and the title of our show today is uh, to get updated on BDS. And that stands for Boycott, Divest, and Sanction. And it means Boycott, Divest, and Sanction Israel. But it goes further than that. We'll talk about that today on U.S. college campuses and elsewhere here under the show we call Bigotry in America. Welcome back, Max. It's nice to see you. It's great to see you, too. Great to be back. So let's talk about the, the status of BBS, uh, B, BDS. Let's First, let's define for anybody who doesn't know what it is. Let's define what it is. Sure. So uh, BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. Uh, it's a global campaign to basically isolate Israel. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, you'll see it described in media and on social media as a human rights movement uh, or a movement to uh, pressure Israel to change its policies. But if you look below the surface, uh, the actual goals as stated by its leaders and, and also, you know, if you look at its website and read between the lines, the goal is to end Israel's existence as a Jewish and democratic state to deny Jewish people the right to self-determination. Um, most people don't support that goal, um, but they sometimes will get behind a BDS campaign because it's not being sold to them that way. It's being sold as, you know, if you support human rights, you should support BDS. If you, you know, want to pressure Israel to change its policies, you should support BDS. But, you know, they're, they're signing on to something that, um, I think in many cases they disagree with, actually. Yeah. And what's interesting about it, too, is that um, this is focused on Israel. Israel is a democratic state. It has the same kind of tumult, uh, maybe too much of tumult, if in my opinion, <laughs> as the U.S. has. Um, people, you know, argue and debate things. Uh, they vote on things and uh, the courts decide things. And sometimes it's goes this way, sometimes it goes that way. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, you can't say it's uh, authoritarian in any way. And yet there are authoritarian governments all over the world um, that are racist, um, that, that are, you know, worthy of um, protest. Um, but BDS doesn't care about them. Do you understand that, Max? I mean, what is the situation where you have Israel, democratic state, um, being criticized, heavily criticized by BDS, uh, where these other places, I'll give you Saudi Arabia, where they dismember anyone who gets in the way. Um, why, why doesn't BDS go after them? Yeah, I mean, uh, on the one hand, um... You know, people are allowed to be especially passionate about one issue. You know, they're allowed to be especially passionate about something like, you know, ending the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and, and, you know, bringing a better future to people in that region. Um, on the other hand, there is absolutely a completely disproportionate, I think, obsession both in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world in some corners with this particular issue and an obsession in a way where it's not like, you know, the Israeli government should change this or that policy. But again, that Israel should cease to exist. It's so fundamentally evil that, um, you know, it, it shouldn't exist, which you don't really see uh, with any other country. And, and, you know, certainly countries that are much, much more repressive than Israel is. Um, but I, I think the, the deeper issue here is really that uh, not only do you have this, you know, basically destructive movement um, getting well-meaning people behind it, who are very passionate about this issue, it's also fundamentally not helping. This is a movement that actually tries to shut down cooperation and dialogue, any kind of meaningful cooperation and dialogue between Israelis and Palestinians. So not only do you have something focusing a lot of people's attention on, uh, you know, a very, you know, I mean, frankly, it's it's a it's a bad situation. Like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a tragedy for so many people involved. It's a bad situation. You have this movement focusing all these people's attention on it, but not in a way that makes it better, that actually makes it worse. Um, and and that, that's, that's the really unfortunate thing about all of this, I think. 
Well, what do they do? I mean, uh, I, what I've heard is um, you're going to be the expert, not me, but um, they will, for example, um, boycott uh, any exchange of uh, students or academics between the two countries. People who might engage in a constructive conversation are being separated and that the exchange is being boycotted. So from a college campus, uh, kids can't go to Israel and Israel people can't come to the campus. And, and so you're shutting it down. Um, the vest, um, you know, is is, is equally uh, summary and destructive, as you said. Um, and sanction, I, you know, I mean, sanction is a is a real blunderbuss of of things that can happen, which, as you said, don't, don't really help. So, how do they actually operate? What what do they do to achieve the BDS aspect of their mission? Yeah. So you you have a uh, something known as the uh, boycott National Committee, which is uh, located in, in the West Bank, um, and they, you know, they coordinate the BDS movement globally. But you've got a lot of international organizations that are are really leading the charge. Important to note, uh, according to the New York Times, uh, the boycott National Committee includes terrorist organizations like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Um, and so, you know, again, you have this movement sold as, uh, you know, sort of civil society, human rights organizations, but in includes representation from groups who are very much not that. Um, and so, you know, you've got some some like, activists and groups operating, you know, within the actual region where the conflict is happening. Uh, but then mostly you have a lot of international organizations focusing on campuses, focusing on sometimes city councils, churches other institutions, um, and they're all pushing the same general kind of campaign and message, uh, which is, you know, to, to, again, to isolate Israel from the rest of the world, to turn international public opinion against Israel, uh, with the ultimate goal of ending its existence and denying Jews the right to self-determination. Interesting to note that, you know, while you, you know, in, on some campuses, you have these BDS campaigns gaining traction, as you're saying, even going so far as to call for ending study abroad programs, like ending educational programs, you know, the reason universities exist is for education and to increase understanding of the world around us. Um, and, and, you know, you have these campaigns that are the opposite of that. Um, so, so you have these types of things increasing in momentum on some college campuses. And at the same time, the very opposite thing is happening uh, in much of the Arab world. Right? For the longest time, uh, so much of the Arab world boycotted Israel uh, to you know, really no benefit. Um, it was only harmful. Uh, and now you have you know, increasingly you know, more countries signing peace agreements with Israel, or you know, if they don't have open peace agreements, they have uh, some kind of behind the scenes relations or economic ties with with Israel. Um, and it, it's a fundamentally good thing that that is trending in the absolute right direction. And even with public opinion, um, you know, there's still very serious issues with anti Semitism in the Middle East, uh, but it's going in the right direction there. Uh, mm. But it seems to be going in the wrong direction, at least in some circles here in the United States and, and in Europe. Um, it's a bizarre time. It's a, it's, a, it's a strange, strange oh, yeah. time in yeah. that way. Oh, yeah. um, you mentioned Hamas um, and another uh, terrorist uh, organization. So, and I recall when, uh, when you and I last spoke a long time ago, I, I read some articles that suggested to me and books that um, these organizations were not only involved, but they were funding uh, BDS. And in other words, uh, it wasn't just uh, they were expressing opinions, maybe uh, fashioning policy and, um, you know, and organizing the activities of the organization, um, but they were actually funding it. Is there any truth to that now? Are they funding it now? We don't have evidence that, you know, terrorist organizations are giving funding to groups in the U.S. to promote BDS campaigns. Uh, we do have evidence, though, that you know, there are organizations that have, you know, either ideologically support these terrorist groups um, or, you know, have, you know, so, some ties from the past uh, when, you know, when groups like Hamas were a little bit more brazen about, you know, trying to gain political influence in the U.S., you know, let's say back in the 90s. Um, you have some similar players who are still involved in various organizations that promote BDS campaigns in the states who were, you know, involved all the way back then and, and had these ties to um, 
you know, actually with people who are still major leaders in Hamas. Um, so, you know, we, yeah, we can't say that for, for certain at all that right now there is Hamas money flowing to, you know, BDS campaigns on college campuses or anything like that. Uh, but the ideological ties and sometimes the personal ties are certainly there. Let me ask you this, Max, if, if, um, if BDS were, you know, completely honest and legitimate and didn't have this kind of double mission that you describe. It had a single mission, um, you know, of establishing better relations uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. How would that change what it is doing? I mean, if you were, <laughs> it's a silly question, but if you were the president of BDS uh, and you wanted to be sincere and legitimate about achieving a legitimate mission to make peace in, in Israel. Um, what, how would you change what they do, their activities? Well, I mean, you, you'd basically be a completely different organization if, if you wanted, and, and, and uh, campaign and movement if you wanted to do that. But uh, I mean, I think it starts with, uh, you know, any and every effort that can be made to build trust between Israelis and Palestinians on the ground. The biggest sort of one of the biggest um, tragedies that has come out of really like the last 20 years, 20 plus years of the Israeli Palestinian conflict is that you know, after an initial wave of hope that there would be a peace agreement in the 90s and an increase in you know, direct relationships and trust building between the two communities, that has been completely shattered. If you look at polls of Israelis and Palestinians, their trust for each other is at an all-time low. And there's overwhelming just pessimism that there is going to be a peace agreement anytime in the near future. And it's very difficult to make significant progress and establish a true and lasting peace without trust. Um, and so, so that's where it starts. Um, you know, certainly there's plenty you know, for citizens of Israel and, and, and for, for, you know, Palestinians ruled by the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, there's an immense amount that they can be doing to, uh, you know, hold their own governments accountable for various things um, and, and try to change, you know, the way their own leaders approach, uh, you know, relations with Israel or, or you know, in the opposite direction. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we have to also understand that if you're not actually living in the conflict, if you're not a citizen of Israel who's voting for in Israeli elections, if you're not, you know, Palestinian and have you know leaders that are representing you um, domestically and internationally, um, you have a, a there, there's a certain limits to what you can actually accomplish. At the end of the day, you have to support people on the ground who are actually experiencing whatever consequences there are from you know, what you're gonna do. Um, and that's a foremost responsibility that we feel certainly, but cert the BDS movement certainly does not. As I said, they're only making the situation worse. So what, what, what is it that drives the people who fashion the policies, the activities of BDS to do this kind of divisive uh, publicity, this, this attempt to make um, the two sides, effectively to make the two sides further apart, uh, to divide them? What, what, what's in it for them? Why do they do that? Is there a, a long-term mission or a long-term uh, um, you know, goal of, of dividing people? Well, something that's been at the core of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict since the beginning, you know, since the early 1900s, is this narrative that Jews are foreigners, are colonizers in that land who have no right to be there, or at least who have no right to you know, have their own state and, and self-determination there. Um, and this is, you know, again, th this has been a message coming from the Palestinian leadership and has been ingrained um, in that way since very, very early on. And it is really at the, at the core of what BDS, you know, the story that BDS movement activists and groups tell about this conflict. Um, they view it as, you know, the Israelis are the evil European colonizers and the Palestinians are the indigenous victims, and it's completely a zero-sum game. 
um, you know, no in between. And, you know, it's Palestinians have to win, Israelis have to lose. And, and you know, there's, there's no compromise there. There's no compromise that's possible if that's what your ideology is and that's what you truly believe. It, you know, the, the, the main reason, you know, the, the main tragedy in all of that, aside from the fact that it's just blatantly false, to the notion that Jews have no connection to that land that is the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. That's a historical fact. Um, you know, people want to write it off as like some like, you know, biblical story. No, it's, it's a, it's history and archeology span um, that, that proved that. Um, so, so you have, you know, an ideology and a narrative that's based on a lie. And it's a tragic lie because the more that they promote the delusion that, you know, the Israelis are foreigners there and they can be somehow pressured to leave or can be pressured to give up their rights to their own independent state, the more that, you know, they're fueling this conflict, the more they're just pushing the Israelis into a defensive stance where they're, you know, they're never, like, they look across from them and they see, you know, a message that you don't belong here, you're a foreigner here, you have to leave, or you don't, you know, you don't deserve a country here and, and you know, what's the conclusion from that that this is this conflict will be endless yeah. that you know the 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 only way we can exist here is is you know um the way it is now which is tragic it yeah. shouldn't be like this well so uh, i get i'm asking now about the dynamic of it you know because my recollection is that back in the early 20th century, there was a there was a relative peace between the, the Jews and the Arabs. Um, they they made deals, contracts, they bought and sold things, they collaborated in business. Um, but somewhere along the line, it went off the side. Uh, I guess because of the leadership of the Palestinians who wanted their land back. Um, but query, query, what's the dynamic now? You you imply that um, it's getting worse. Is that true? Well, it, it depends how you slice it, basically, right? So, you know, within Israel, you have um, about, let's say, 20% of the population, maybe a little less, um, who are Arab citizens of Israel. Um, and in some ways, their integration into the Israeli economy, into Israeli society uh, is improving. Like the current Israeli government has includes a party that represents primarily religious Arab Muslim citizens of the state and the government, you know, in large part because that party is in the government, um, they just allocated $16 billion to improving the you know, prosperity and security of um, Arab communities in the state. Um, so, you know, you, you look at polls of, um, you know, Arab citizens of Israel and over time and, and there's, there's positive trends in terms of um, their feeling of, of belonging. There's certainly plenty of challenges still despite that, but there's some positive trends there. Increased education, attainment, things like that. Well, they, um, they, go, they go to school, they graduate school, they, uh, they're doctors and lawyers and, um, and the like, and scientists. Uh, it seems to me that my view when I just see the media is that there are, there are Arabs in every picture. Yeah, and so, and so there, there's... There's ways you can slice it where there are very positive trends also in terms of relationships with a number of Arab countries like the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Morocco and, and others. Um, these relationships are increasing and, and they're, not, uh, they're not just at a government level, they're also at a more grassroots people to people level. And that, that's, that's huge. I mean, that, you know, it's, it's really never been like that um, until very recently. Hmm. Um, but between Israelis and Palestinians um, in the West Bank and Gaza and, and you know in various refugee camps around the region, um, trust ties cooperation have decreased overall, uh, and 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 that's 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 where it's you know it's tragic and, and it doesn't go to a good place. I will say that uh, there are efforts underway right now by the current Israeli government to. Uh, at least on an economic level, uh, try to, you know, try to increase some of that cooperation and, and try to um, help the Palestinian Authority improve standards of living um, in the areas um, where they govern. Um, so, you know, it, it's not that there's no efforts happening. There's also plenty of grassroots organizations that uh, try to bring Israelis and Palestinians together. 
Um, so it's not that no one's trying, but um, but certainly it's it's not in a great place. Yeah. So I mean, I've seen articles. Um, one recently struck me. It says the mask is coming off BDS. And when you take the mask off BDS, what you get is anti-Semitism. And indeed, if you look at the BDS protest, pictures of the protests, you'll see Jewish stars at the wrong end of their protest signs. I mean, they're protesting Jews, uh, not Israel. They're saying Zionism is Judaism. It's synonymous. Um, is, is that correct? Is that what's happening? Has it always been like that or is it becoming more like that? Uh, there, there's, there's always been a strong element in, you know, when, when people say, well, I, you know, I'm anti-Zionist, not anti-Semitic. Well, first, let's define Zionism. Zionism is a liberation movement. It's about the right of Jewish people to self-determination in their homeland. The right to self-determination is a universal right that all people have under international law. So if you're saying that, you know, you oppose this right for Jewish people, there's almost virtually no situation in which that's not discriminatory on some level. Um, now, you know, people start to come up with different definitions and interpretation of what Zionism means. Some people just think it means that, oh, you support the government of Israel and its policies. That's not what it means. But if people think that's what it is, then they're saying, oh, you know, I'm not anti-Semitic. I just, you know, oppose um, Israeli government policies, um, in which case, you know, they're right in a sense, but they're also wrong about what Zionism is. So it gets confusing. Um, you know, I, I think with these, the types of protests you're talking about and some of these campaigns, um, what we're seeing happening is that, and, and it, it, it was always, I think, the inevitable result of, of these BDS campaigns that they say, oh, we're just targeting Israel and its institutions, but the damage is always uh, falling on Jewish students and Jewish organizations. And just recently, we we saw, uh, you know, multiple resolutions on, on on different campuses where, like you said, they they take the mask off and they start directly targeting, you know, the major Jewish organizations on campus or trying to, you know, deny, you know, vendors for kosher food on campus uh, the ability to, you know, to do business there unless they meet some ridiculous political litmus test of opposition to Israel's existence. Um, and, and that's, I mean, that's just beyond the pale because the vast majority of Jewish people support Israel's existence and in fact think that denying Israel's right to exist is a form of anti-Semitism. So, you know, I think um, these groups aren't really living in, in, uh, in reality, frankly. You know, I always wonder. It's, it's, it's a it's a it's a fantasy world, but but unfortunately, it's a, it's a fantasy world that has some really negative real life consequences. I mean, we saw hate crimes on the streets of American cities, driven by some of these hateful narratives, only a few months back in May and June. So, um, well, including yeah. murders in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Well, so so that's interesting. So so you you have you have now anti-Semitic violence coming from different sides of the political spectrum. And so, you know, the, the, the murders in Pittsburgh, that was a white supremacist who you know, had a sort of, you know, this ideology was like a far right version of anti-Semitism, which is extremely dangerous. Um, but then, you know, you have these physical assaults that were happening in New York and Los Angeles and, and Toronto and other places, in, you know, in European cities too, um, that were, you know, driven by, you know, either far left forms of anti-Semitism or like, you know, forms of anti-Semitism that exist um, among extremists in the Muslim world, let's say. Um, you know, there, that's part of the challenge with this form of bigotry is that it comes from a lot of different places. It can take a lot of different forms, um, many times driven by ignorance, not people having malicious intentions, but sometimes it rises to the point where, you know, people are motivated to engage in violence. Yeah. You know, I always wondered uh, who would who would push back on that because it's it's irrational, it's hateful. Um, it seems to be uh, these days growing. A lot of my Jewish friends tell me they think it's growing, uh, even here in Hawaii. Eh? Um, and I wonder if you know there's an organization or a place, and whether it's effective. Maybe stand with us 
um, that to 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 deal with the the problems in public opinion because I think BDS is very good. That's why they're on the campuses. They know that you know if you train a student into your way of thinking, the student is like to carry that into his or her life and career and social experience. And so you know what what is the countervailing force, if any? Uh, that says, no, 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 this is wrong. You shouldn't do this. The, the force that says BDS is wrong, you shouldn't do this. And is it effective? Yeah, well, I, I think the, the first thing if you're talking about campuses is, is there's so many, you know, really courageous and committed student activists who, you know, they stand up for their communities, they stand up for what's right, and, and they push back and they say, no, this is wrong. Um, and a huge part of what my organization Stand With Us does is we support those students. Uh, we, we, you know, we provide them with resources. We make sure that um, they have everything they, they need because it's it's not easy at all to stand up to this kind of hate. Um, you know, depending on the school, it can lead to you know social negative social consequences, all kinds of things. Um, but you know, we're here to support students like that. Um, you know, and activists in in you know all kinds of communities and institutions. Um, you know, really, we're here as a resource for anyone who wants to educate about Israel, about the conflict, and also fight anti-Semitism. Um, you know, we know that our organization on its own, uh, we certainly, you know, we, we can't fight this fight by, by ourselves, but we can really do so much good by providing resources to people who care and want to educate, and also to, you know, to bring more people into that fold, um, to, to grow the number of people who um, you know, want to educate others and, and, and also push back against this bigotry. Um, so, you know, we're, we're doing that work every day. Uh, we have many partner organizations that we're thankful for that are doing that work every day. Um, we need more help, of course, always. Yeah. Can, can we use more allies in this fight? Always. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. Uh, well, you but, and I have known each other for about three years or so, and I, and I wonder over that period, um, this is something you do observe and study, uh, whether this is getting more shrill on American college campuses and for that matter, Canadian college campuses. Because, uh, you know, the fact is that BDS, um, from whatever source, has the money, it has the people. Um, and it is dedicated to to try to bring down Israel uh, and, uh, you know, taking the mask off uh, is dedicated to bringing down the Jewish people. And it's it's very active in that regard. And it's uh, it's in the press and it's on the campuses trying to sell its bill of goods. And my question to you is, say, over the past three years or maybe five um, has it become more active and more effective on the campuses? Have these BDS groups on the campuses of the, of the United States grown? Uh, have they grown during the Trump administration, for example? Because there's been a lot of divisiveness, a lot of hatred, a lot of racial strife, if you will, um, in the country and especially on the campuses. Does that include the BDS issue? Yeah, I, I think it has grown. I mean, it's important, though, to understand that you know, you can have, uh, you know, a campus where one year it's really, really active and, and causing a lot of damage and, and dividing students and, and creating a lot of hate. And, you know, the next year or the year after that, um, it won't be that way at all. Um, so that's that's an important thing to understand about campuses. What is that? Is that, is that a function of media? Is it a fu function of campus administration? Is it a function of the weather? What, what makes that change that way? It, it can it can be you know administrations taking the issue more seriously it can simply be the fact that you know the students who were leading the charge on on some of this stuff just they graduate they leave and you know maybe other students come in who have a different perspective and, and different motivations yeah. um so, so so you know the, so there's there's a lot of nuances to it but yeah i would say there's an increase really there's an increase in um sometimes how blatant and brazen the hate is. You know, so sometimes, you know, in the past, um, some of these campaigns would be more cautious in the types of claims they would make. But now you have these crazy conspiracy theories being promoted on campuses that, you know, Israel is somehow responsible for uh, police brutality in the United States, which is like, I mean, that echoes some of the oldest anti-Semitic smears about, you know, Jews being to blame for all these awful things that different societies were experiencing from like the Black Plague to 
you know, it, mm -hmm. wars and any number of different things. It's the same pattern just applied to, you know, one of the biggest, if not the biggest social injustice that exists in the United States today. Um, so it's a, it's unfortunately a familiar anti-Semitic tactic that we now see translated uh, to campuses to this issue that so many people, you know, really rightfully feel so passionately about. And, you know, the, these situations like we talked about before, where it's these Jewish organizations targeted and kosher vendors and all these things, you didn't see this stuff so, you know, blatantly publicly stated in the past as it is mm. now. You know, one thing I've noticed, and this is my last question for you, Max, <clears throat> one thing I've noticed is the conflation of the Palestinian issue, which is, I guess, treated as a, a liberal cause. I mean, it's been cast as a liberal cause by, by BDS and other groups on similar lines, um, conflating that liberal cause with other liberal causes with every liberal cause. I mean, stop the pipeline, <laughs> you know? And, I mean, with environmental issues, racial issues, uh, all kinds of uh, government initiative issues, uh, goes on and on. And then it falls into, what do you want to call it? The, the liberal bin of liberal issues. And sometimes there's no connection whatsoever, but it's handy. It's handy to conflate all the liberal issues and throw the Palestinian issue in there. So, and that's, that's false. It's a, it's a false um, analysis. It's a false connection. But, you know, you have to think of these issues, you know, separately, and you have to apply critical thinking and all that. So my, my last question to you, Max, is, so here you have an impressionable uh, student, freshman, sophomore, maybe junior, even senior, in a college campus. He's, he's approached with someone who would love to have him conflate every single you know, liberal issue, including especially the Palestinian issue. What do you say to him? You, you're meeting him on the campus. Um, you know what they're saying to him. You know the conflation problem. What do you say to get him off that track? Well, I think that something that is, is increasingly, I think, a focus for a lot of people, include especially on college campuses, is you know not always following what is sort of like a um, a dominant narrative or, or a narrative that that's focused on your own perspective um, of and, and and what you personally see of the world, but trying to understand things from other people's point of view, right? And so what's happening here is that all these issues that are um, you know at front of mind for people in the United States um, and, and how we view these things in the, in the United States, that's all getting projected onto the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a completely different issue that's thousands and thousands of, thousands of miles away and has a completely different history and set of dynamics to it. Um, and so in some ways it's the same message as you know, is being sent about so many different issues here in the US on campuses, right? Where people are being told, don't, you know, check your privilege, right? Like, don't assume that your experience is the same as someone else's. Uh, try to put yourself in other people's shoes, listen to others, because, you know, they probably have something to teach you that, you know, you don't understand because you're from a different community or different experience for any number of different reasons. That should apply just as well to a conflict thousands of miles away that, you know, as much as it's easy to think about it as if it's, you know, in the same box as, you know, Native American issues, issues that so many different communities face. Um, why, why, would you, why would you equate those things, you know, with a conflict thousands of miles away if you don't equate, you know, everyone's, it, all these different communities experiences here if you wouldn't equate your own experiences with someone else's here why is it different i would try to get people to think about it that way yeah to see the nuance not to throw it all in the same bin <clears throat> so when stand with us goes out and talks to these impressionable students is that what it says um how do you handle that issue how do you handle getting the word out uh, to clarify their way of looking at things, to um, clarify their critical thinking. 
Like I said, we we work with students on, you know, at this point, hundreds of college campuses um, who are themselves passionate about educating their peers about these issues. Um, and so we're, we're really uh, we're really about empowering people, uh, empowering students and others who care about these issues to first, you know, be as educated as they can themselves and then um, have these, you know, interesting, sometimes difficult conversations with their peers on the ground. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're always we're always trying to provide factual information, and also help people um, really lead with empathy um, and, and, you know, not assume things about whoever they're talking to and, and always, you know, try to drive towards um, some kind of respectful um, and ultimately positive vision of the future um, where it's not, you know, this zero sum game where one side has to win and one side has to lose, um, but that we're we're trying to ultimately do what we can to help bring about a better future for both peoples. Yeah, it always helps if you take the hate out. <clears throat> That's been the problem of the country. You know, uh, Max, uh, these these people that you're talking about, these people on the college campuses, if you ever want to set up a show with Think Tech Hawaii, we can zoom in in every city, every campus in the country. We'd love to talk to some of them um, with you. Um, so uh, I just want to plant that seed with you that we'd love to do a show with some of the people you're talking about. In any event, I greatly appreciate you coming on and answering my questions and talking about this subject. In many ways, people don't want to talk about it, but I, I really appreciate your coming on and talking about it. Thank you, Max. Thanks for having me. Aloha. 